So hello everybody and thank you so much to the KDIGO organisers for inviting me to come and speak at the Home Dialysis Conference about why or why not you might want to take home dialysis and to give a, a bit of a patient's perspective on that. So my name is uh, Fiona Loud, I'm Policy Director for the UK Kidney Patient Support Charity and you can see uh, some of my contact details etc below. And while I campaign and do a lot of work to support other kidney patients, I also have that experience for myself. And I have spent a little bit of time, a long time ago, um, on home therapies. Just to uh, rush on through this one or press on through this one, I don't have any COIs to declare. So let's look at an overview uh, of my talk uh, today. So we're going to be covering how does kidney care and different types of on the modality feel to the patient but also to their family as well who be involved with this and what matters to the person what matters to the individual what would be the good things and what are the trade-offs what, what are the perhaps the more challenging things to, to consider and that matter to you and really importantly especially at this time of covid which will is, is infused through my talk and you'll understand that's that's the way it is at the moment um, so how should services respond better to patient priorities and finally, what about the sort of barriers, incentives, and what are some of the resources we can call on to help people in, in uh, making a choice towards home therapies? Mm -hmm. So let's look at about the home, you know, how this looks, the modality education and kidney care itself filled with the service user. So um, although I'll be reporting on some, some slightly more organized surveys, I did the, um, the thing of going in and just having a look at some of the patient conversations that are happening at the moment. And this is reflected by what patients have told us more formally as well, but it really does feel very variable, the service uh, that people are receiving. Uh, it's pretty remote. Um, there's not been any face-to-face -face contact for, with uh, patients, with their doctors um, in many, many cases for a long, long time. Now you may say that's not necessary for everybody and that is true, um, and some people do love having fewer checkups, but people are missing that personal touch. I mean, it's fine having a blood test from time to time and having a phone call, but you know, the personal touch is greatly valued and th there is something missing there as well. So what are some of the patients saying at the moment? Uh, you see a few little quotes sprinkled across my screen. So somebody that, uh, that started uh, ED, well, that, well, the last time they saw a, a consultant was uh, February, 2020 just before they started PD, and now they have a call of every quarter. Now they like that because they don't have to keep traveling to it. Um, somebody else is saying the last time they saw someone face-to-face was in 2019, and they had a couple of phone consultations last year. I hope they had some blood tests during that time. I guess they did, and they really want to see someone face-to-face. -face. Um, and then again, other people, and there is a typo in that, but I, that's because I, I took that straight from a, a patient comment there. So a lot of uh, different, different ways in which care is being given at the moment. One of the things that has come up, and, and you'll all know this, is how it feels with this reduced access to surgery. Uh, so what's been many, many transplants have been, uh, the transplant service has been suspended in part for, well, for, for a year now. I mean, wave one and wave two in particular, um, but also dialysis access as well. Some of the access to the surgery, to the, the theatre space, to, to you're able to the surgeons that's been that's been difficult as well and that really built up throughout 2020 in some parts of the country and in some areas it just simply didn't catch up when we had a bit of a pause uh, in the pandemic at the late summer time as well so that's back to that variability again and you'll see a couple of things uh, again in, in my quotes here is something from um, this was actually on the Belfast one of the Belfast newspapers in Northern Ireland um, that um, we were all kind of it epitomizes one of the, the problems of somebody who was waiting for PD. He put his gown on, he was told he had to go home because there was no, no room for him to have that, that access surgery. And the kind of disappointment behind that and the build up to get someone to the hospital, to have them not eat, all of those things. It's, it's very, very difficult for people who, who, who um, in that instance, that person's transplant was failing. Um, as well to have to deal with. So those are the kind of difficulties. And I think this thing about dialysis access being seen as elective is very disturbing because it is not elective in the traditional sense. It is life maintaining access to life maintaining surgery. 
and somebody might go down very, very quickly and need that dialysis really, really urgently. Um, and yet we've got some, you know, a couple of other little, little uh, examples I've got on the screen here, which you can read for yourself and about how um, that somebody who's waiting for, for a transplant, a live, live donation, which they were able to get using PD in the meantime, worked very well for them. So a bit of pre-planning, and that's about those personal conversations that help there. And some, some good praise that, that you can see there for, for the teams that have, that have been helping people. So uh, a mixed picture there, but, but some emotion in there as well. And through our counselling service, we hear quite a lot of that. So we offer a free counselling service to patients who can self-refer to the charity for that help. And they're very busy. So what matters to the individual? And let's look a little bit more at some of those priorities and the, and the trade-offs that perhaps I've hinted out already. So one of the big things about, about home therapies is it does offer a greater protection from COVID. We can see that in the figures. People have been able to effectively you know, shield in the UK, we've called it shielding. That means staying at home, staying away from lots of other people. It's not an easy thing to do. I've been doing it for nearly a year now, on and off. Um, but it does give that give that safety from 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 COVID and, and from the inevitable um, uh, contact with lots of other patients, lots of drivers through transport um, and, and and staff when you have to go into a dialysis unit for your treatment. Also, I think something that's great about, about home therapies uh, uh, is that independence, the ability to do your own thing, choose your dialysis when you want. Yes, it's demanding. Yes, it has to be frequent, but you can do it yourself and you can choose to do it at night time. And so a lot of people who, once they've managed to do it at night time, really do speak very positively of it. But it can take quite a long time to get to that. The ability to work, to carry on working. We'll talk a bit more about the financial impact of, of COVID in a, in a minute, but actually you'll all know that if you go to hospital a lot of the week, it's pretty hard to have a job. Um, and the chance, of course, what's really important to people to give them a bit more hope is the chance of a transplant. And that's been very difficult this year, although it has happened in some places. And in a non-COVID time, I'm, when I talk about travel there, I don't mean travel to and from dialysis. I mean travel, take a break, go on holiday. We're all missing that. But, but for people on, on home therapies, it, it's easier if they manage to carry their dialysis equipment with them uh, to be able to travel um, and have a little bit more freedom. But on the other side, there is a lack of space there uh, in some properties. There's a theme, a theme of loneliness, which I think is always there actually for people with, who are on home therapies. There's, a, you know, there's less contact with peers in the dialysis unit. You know, your friends that you will become friends if you see them three times a week, some of them will be. And then there's a burden on the family. And then there's a thing about, not being confident in your technique maybe it's going wrong and you haven't you don't feel confident in doing it or perhaps you don't feel like asking the staff or the staff are too busy um, and then just a really practical issue that came up is about deliveries uh, we were heard from some patients during this time who were on home therapies that drivers were saying well we, to be covid safe we won't bring supplies into your house and actually for somebody who's quite frail um, that's really not, not not great so there's some practical Things that came up, which uh, some of which were sorted, but it doesn't take much for patients to share that with other patients to sort of lose confidence. So I referred already to a couple of pieces of work that Kidney Care UK has done over the past year around COVID-19 patient experience, and I thought it would be helpful just to give you a couple of um, just highlights of, of what patients were telling us. So this was back um, in May and June, so people were still having to shield. Um, to stay away from everybody uh, as much as they possibly could. The mental health impact, as you can see there, was quite widely uh, reported uh, and very a large number of people reporting uh, disruption to care, which I've discussed a little bit, uh, people not getting checkups at all at that time. Of course, that's better now. But one in four people reported worried about getting food. Uh, so we heard a lot from people who simply couldn't get the right, either the right food or just food full stop. And that, that was, we would think that, that's kind of an unintended consequence of all of this. So people did start to get food boxes, government supplied food boxes, which helped a bit, um, but that wasn't always renal suitable food as well. So, um, and there was a bit of confusion about government advice. Everybody wanted really straight information um, and some people didn't know uh, people on dialysis weren't actually advised to shield just to start with due to all kinds of um, things, but eventually they were because that, that they were told by their renal units to do so, but, uh, but the authorities' point of view. 
um, people weren't therefore able to get government support, like the food boxes I just, just mentioned, so had to go out to the shops instead. So we created a, a patient information resource, which has been very well accessed um, throughout this period of time. Uh, and it's uh, updated two or three times a week uh, with the, you know, because people want that information. And as new policy comes out, new advice from government, we try to support people with that too. So I'd like to just share a really positive story here. Um, Stephen Donner, someone that we know very well, we've given support through our advocacy service. Um, uh, he, um, his, his kidneys, uh, his one kidney failed. Um, they've been self-isolating uh, since March 2020. Uh, his kidney did fail. He, ha he chose home dialysis. He chose PD. That's the nurse with him. That's the only person they let into their house for, for all those months. Um, and this was these uh, photographs he shared with their local uh, newspapers. So um, he was happy to share that. And they were incredibly anxious and what they um what they absolutely um were able to um to 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 gain from that i suppose was the um the fact that they, they could contain it and they could continue to work from home they had a very very uh, supportive employer and they um they walked loads of mountains since since the diagnosis and the great thing about that that particular story is that um he managed to get a transplant in 2020 so all their care paid off and PD was able to help them enormously get through that difficult period of time. But the personal touch was great. And they're very happy now, <laughs> of course. So how should services respond better to these priorities? I'd say we, you know, ask patients how they're doing. We heard a little bit there earlier about how people have, perhaps haven't been contacted very much at all. When you do talk to them, use every interaction to understand what's going on with their lives. What are the barriers there? What's going on in their lives? What might perhaps mean that you know maybe this technique will start to fall, fail for them, or they'll feel they can't do it anymore? Because sometimes that intervention can help prevent something developing. Really talk to the family members as well. You heard about Steve and Donna there. Donna was completely a part of this. I mean, she was able to carry on working, but to support her husband through that difficult time. So meet that patient halfway. Don't wait to be told or until something's gone wrong. Um, and then listen to the patient, listen to the patient voices and learn and then commission your services accordingly. So, and I know this is in an ideal world, but you know, if there, if there is better mental health support, if some, some of the other barriers that I'll talk about later on that can be addressed, then, then that can only help and collaborate. And I won't have time to, to talk through this one in, in this talk, but a great example of a, of a partnership approach is something called KQIP, a, quality, a Kidney Quality Improvement Partnership with Daylife, which is a dialysis at yours. And that's something that we as a charity are working with, with, with industry and lots of different renal units uh, to identify different areas for improvement. And one of those is in one particular part of the country is on bringing dialysis home. And that was having some great results before the pandemic came in. So that's a proactive way the service can innovate too. So um, our, second, um, our second survey, uh, which was run later in the year, uh, in the autumn, uh, uh, in the lull period, I just think talking about what's going on in people's lives there, the mental health tale, which has got worse again, you can see some figures there about people talking about their anxiety, the disruption to health services continuing on, and very sadly, people feeling they couldn't get health advice, they didn't wanna bother people. And the employment point that, that I mentioned before, about people expected to go back to work, some of them in frontline jobs, some of them in the NHS as well, and feeling they had to go back. They were worried because we knew COVID was still out there um, and um, some were not getting support from their employers. So those are some of the more complex things that are happening in families uh, and in the backgrounds as well. And we called that one out of sight, out of mind. Each of the titles are from things that patients told us. So if I look at some of those incentives and barriers there, I've probably already touched on, on, I've definitely already touched on some of those, but from a patient perspective, what would help? So education, not just information, information, yes, but education is, is, is more proactive. It's a more of a two-way thing. Peer support, I've mentioned that before, I'll mention it again just in a minute. And some practical help. There are some practical things for people to find out about. We have some of that in you know, some of our patient information, but there are things like, People, oh, can I get help with paying my utility bills? You know, perhaps I'm worried about my, my, my water bills and things like that. And where am I going to keep my stuff? And do I need extra home insurance if I get my carpets ruined by a spillage? 
those are all some of the really practical things that, that, that the experienced staff can help with and the charities can help with. Excellent technical support. If a machine goes down, um, people can still get their dialysis um, and check in a lot. Use the phone, see how people are doing. You saw that lovely example of Steve sitting there with his PD nurse. You're building that trusted relationship can really, really help. And also remember the local community service as well, because there will be sometimes grants available for people to support some of this stuff. And we as a charity, we give people grants for sheds to keep their stuff in. We've got a whole line of patient grants that we give for sheds just for people to keep their, their bits and pieces in. So um, that might be one of the things there. And I want to just continue with that education theme. This is not possible nowadays, but something we did do um, was run a range of, of road shows for people, which is um, going around the country with with advocates speaking to patients. Um, and you can stay there, a little camper van there um, with Ernest and Marjorie talking to someone about um, about what it's like for him to undergo um, PD. Um, and um, that when you put people together, local staff, uh, local patients, um, and others, you actually get some some really great conversations, and that brought people forward for dialysis, uh, for home therapies as well, by seeing, imagine themselves in that situation. But now with the re more remote consultations, that's more challenging. With the webinars, that's something that does work for some people, but not for everybody. Um, and I have to say that the remote virtual work, you know, it's built around system convenience and need rather than around patient needs. So I think that does need to be far better co-produced. And I'd like now just to touch on a little bit more about patient experience to listen to uh, and learn from. So we, we support the PREM, the Kidney Patient Reported Experience um, Measure Annual Survey. Um, so this is a more validated survey that looks at patient experience. And the way the reason that we do it with our UK Renal Association is that we find that if you can ask people what they think, um, you share, you get people the, give people the opportunity to share in and feed into a service, then that can then result in some co-produced uh, thought um, and outcomes. And that's normally on paper and you can see some samples there. And the national results, I can report back from 2019, many of you will be aware of this, but I guess not everybody. Um, but then there's a few things to say. No matter what modality you have, sharing decisions seems to be the, one of the things that is most variable. So that's sharing decision-making about your treatment, about your care. That's one of the things that perhaps has been you know, lost a little more over the last year due to the COVID pandemic and we could focus on looking forward. But there's also something that, that's come out from, from that work which, which showed that your local unit, regardless of your age, sex, ethnicity or even modality seems to be the, one of the biggest things affecting your experience of care. So there's some more things to be done there as well. On the, I guess on the positive side for home therapies, um, transport and needling are also, um, you know, tend to be marked slightly lower and those those are things that of course can be addressed differently if you're if you're home but just to give a sort of thumbs up there the privacy the dignity the access to the renal team are um are, are noted as being something that's greatly appreciated by patients and i talked just now about sharing local results um so this information is available at a local portal and and i would encourage patients and their their healthcare professional team to um to work together to look at what's happening locally and is there something that, that we together can can work on locally to help people get better access to the information education or overcome any local barriers that might be there you know does some of the information need to be uh, you know in a different language for example um, or are there some other inequalities that may be something that, that, that can be done about to to address access to therapies and really briefly just to touch on Something we, we pulled out the experience of, uh, of PD patients from the 2019 work and I think it's really good to compare the two together and you'll see that privacy and dignity are, are marked high for everybody and also marked high for, for people um, uh, uh, going PD and I'm just talking PD here I just didn't have the HD figures but, they, but, but um, I don't think they're any different on that uh, to show you at the moment um, and sharing decisions um, is, is one of the lower things there. Um, so when you take the other things out, sharing decisions remains a common theme. And perhaps there's something there about the environment, about the challenge of dialyzing at home day in, day out, and the burden of that. So for 2020, um, that's completely gone digital. 
and I'm only showing you this just, just to get people interested in the fact that that will be uh, uh, launched uh, results. So that will come out probably at the end of March. Um, and things went totally digital. So from seven, 16 and a half thousand people uh, filling out forms um, by paper. Um, some of those actually were, were done uh, digitally, but probably only about a couple of thousand. That's gone completely to um, uh, nearly 10,000, all done digitally. Many of those will be at the dialysis units, um, and you'll see there the numbers of how it's how people split. And actually, they haven't changed hugely year on year, and we've still got that um, the participation from people at home too. So that's that'll be good to learn from. But I'm I'm very sure that there'll be a big message about communication there. So almost to start to round up some of my messages here. This is from what we've heard from patients about how they're experiencing their service now. 100% of them want timely, clear advice on COVID-19. They need support, they need protection. Make sure that the, the health service you know, feels open to them. I know it is open to them, but it feels like that as well. So you can show them how it can be safe for them. But bring those modality choices to people where they are, reach out to them, and if, it, you know, if they can, you know, if there are good webinars and there's great you know, local conversations that can happen there. You know, we as a charity hold little short things we call the Kidney Connects where we can bring people together in a very small group. And I know there are even many health practitioners that, that are working on that as well in their, their own units to do that. Don't ignore that fear and anxiety. Yes, we have vaccination, fantastic. Yes, it's going well, but you know, there's a long, long um, tail of that. So don't ignore that and use every interaction. So if you highlight, you know, access to, to support, to counselling, to other things there, use that because this is supporting people as, per, as patients as people, not just as, as, as patients. Sort out some of those practical issues that get them up front. If there's something, something that can easily be sorted, and I mentioned a few of those earlier, let's do that. If it's about deliveries to people's houses, etc. So engage with people in your local community. Um, we know that, that uh, if there are inequalities in the community, they will have been absolutely highlighted by, by the pandemic. So whether you know, poverty will become worse, unemployment has become worse. You've heard us talk about that before. And also, you know, where there is a great ethnically diverse communities, that, will be, that is being particularly felt too. And work with us. Um, we have things that we can suggest uh, to help some of those voices. Um, and before I finish, I thought it would be great to end on a really positive story, um, which, um, so it's about remembering the community. And this was a TV program that went out this week, um, the week I'm recording this, and it's called uh, DIY SOS. And it's a, it's a show with a, 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 they basically look for people or people can apply to it and say, hey, we need practical help to do something with our house and where we live. And this family, those three little girls that you can see at the front, they're triplets. I think they're seven years old now. Um, this is a family of five who are living in a three bedroom house. They desperately wanted to get uh, the two girls who have nephrotic syndrome. Two of those little girls have nephrotic syndrome, Daisy and Amber. And they have to go, one of them has dialysis at home because they haven't got space. The other one goes to a uh, hospital 70 miles away and that has to be three times a week. So the family was in desperate need. And that community through this TV show, all those people there are all volunteers behind them who rebuilt their house for them, built a dialysis unit um, and um, uh, for, for the two girls that they can now have their dialysis at home. So we can sometimes think differently about the way to do that. And we desperately hope that they do get their transplant sooner rather than later, but by able to be bringing both of their girls home so that they could dialyze in comfort at home and be a family again, that's a wonderful advert for what a community can do and what actually what Home dialysis can do for you even if you're in the most difficult situation. So on that note, thank you very much for listening.